All right, I think before we get started, we should take maybe a 15 minute stand up, stretch, break. After, after lunch, this is always kind of the lull of the afternoon. So everyone stand up really quickly. He said I never stop. So let's all stand up, take a little break. I guess the dot, dot, dot could be that I've now taken up surfing. I was in Paniche. Uh, now I can turn the board, so we're making progress here. All right, everyone can now sit back down. And now that you've had a chance to stretch, um, you can uh, or take your time, sure. <laughs> um, now that you're awake, I'm going to put you back to sleep. So everyone, close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you, once your eyes are closed, I see closed eyes, okay. Now open your eyes and imagine that it is your lucky day and you've just won 528 million euro, maybe with some friends at the office. Now, the first question that comes up when you win the lottery is, would you keep your day job? So quick show of hands here. Who would keep their day job if they won the lottery? Okay. It looks like maybe 30%. Who would quit? Who would quit? Okay, great. So there is actually a study done uh, by CareerBuilder in 2014, and they found that 49% of people said they would leave their job, and 51% said they would stay in their job. And this was across all types of jobs, types of companies, industries, et cetera. But the next question that really comes up if we were discussing this over coffee is, well, why would you stay in that job for those of you that raised your hands? And the survey went on to answer this as well. And if any of these apply to you, let me know. But how many of you might stay in your job because you would be bored if you didn't work, maybe? Okay, what about that your work actually gives you purpose and accomplishment and fulfillment? All right, you want the financial security in case maybe you're irresponsible and blow the money and you want, <laughs> want to be sure you can retire. Okay, and how many of you would miss your coworkers despite maybe you complain about them sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> or your boss, maybe they're not here. Um, so a key insight here is that even though we complain about work quite a bit, it is a huge source of fulfillment in our lives. We spend upwards of 40 or probably more hours a week there. I was on Instagram a couple of months ago and I discovered this hashtag called hashtag some Monday. A little hard to say, but I thought, what is this? And it um, turns out it's the moment on a Sunday when that like chill feeling of the weekend is replaced with that anxiety of, oh my gosh, I have all these things I need to do. So maybe, did you experience this on Monday night or Sunday night? The some Mondays. Right. So this leads us to the idea of the paradox of work. And I read about this in a great book called The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr. And it's all about why do we say we hate our jobs, yet we have so much fulfillment from them. And so there was a study done in Chicago back in the 1980s. And this was pre-iPhone, so they had to kind of get a little creative. And they took 400 people and did an experience study where they gave the 400 people pagers. And that pager beeped seven times a day. I don't even know if pagers still exist, but it beeped seven times a day. And at that moment, the people had to record how they were feeling and what they were doing. And that happened for one week. And the results were pretty interesting. The findings were that people were happier and more fulfilled in the work hours than during their leisure hours. And it's interesting because you would think the opposite. But the reality is that it's not necessarily our jobs that make us happy. Even if you love your job, there's still things about it that day to day probably are under your skin. But it's not the job that necessarily makes us happy. It's that our jobs create an environment for flow. So not to sound all woo woo, but if you've ever experienced flow, maybe it sounds like this. You've been working on something and then next thing you know, you have no idea what the music has been for the past 20 minutes or you've been staring at a blank page, you need to write a document, 
and then you're struggling and all of a sudden something happens, you get into the flow and then you have two pages written. That's what I'm talking about. So now we're gonna go a little bit into some neuroscience. I actually almost became a neuroscientist. I had a scholarship back in Canada to study neuroscience and then I fell into the world of whatever we do. But um, quickly, we've got the brain and there's this part of your brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this part of the brain is responsible for something called self-monitoring. So that potentially doubting voice inside your head, or that nag, I can't do it, maybe feelings of imposter syndrome or that inner critic. And something happens when you are in this flow state, getting back to why do our jobs make us happy. And so there were these scientists at John Hopkins University and they wanted to understand what happens to our brain when we are in a flow state. So long story short, they devised a way to put jazz musicians inside an fMRI machine with specially made pianos. And at first, they played the piano um, with songs that were quite common, like probably classical music they'd know by heart. And then they were given the opportunity to ditch the kind of written music and improvise and make things up. And as a result of this, they realized that when you're in a flow state, that part of your brain that's responsible for self-monitoring, it actually starts to dissipate. It's like the volume gets turned down. And that is why we're able to do such awesome things in this flow state. And it leads to more liberation and more creativity, more risk-taking and no more kind of hesitation. And I thought that was so fascinating, especially when you think back to, well, of course, now it makes sense we find this fulfillment because our jobs do provide us these opportunities to get into this flow state. Even if the problem you're solving is something you're not passionate about, the fact that you're overcoming problems, that you're finding solutions, that brings fulfillment. Now, that was a lot, so let's quickly recap. So we are... Oops, okay. We're happiest in our flow state. Flow happens at work because we're not very good at giving ourselves challenges and opportunities to reach this flow state in our leisure time. Now, we can't discuss this topic of work and fulfillment without touching on a key question, and maybe your friends or relatives have asked you this in the past. I know mine have. We have a holiday coming up in the States, and maybe this will come up, but the question is, what's going to happen to our jobs when robots take over? Has anyone ever asked you this? Like, will automation take over? Right. So what's going to happen to the role of product manager, product designer, UX, et cetera? Lucky for us, there is a website. I'm not making this up. Website, willrobotstakemyjob.com. You can go there if you want. When I created this, unfortunately, product manager was not in their database, but I did a little cross-section, so we have graphic designer, anthropologists, software developers, and I think, if we can just make some assumptions, I think we'll be okay. If we look at the data, graphic designers have about an 8% chance you'll be overrun by robots. Anthropologists, you're very safe. Maybe you should switch careers if you're in a high-risk <laughs> high job. Or software developers, they're at about 13%, but I still think it'll be okay. So, no doubt that technology is changing how we are working and we are living. And we experience this not just at work, but in our everyday life. We are seeing self-driving cars, gadgets and things around the house that are meant to make our lives easier, drones, etc. You could come up with so many ideas right now. And this is all great, but my concern is that is it leading us down a path where we are becoming a little less human and maybe a little too much computed in our lives? So this brings us to the idea of anticipatory design and automated design. Maybe you've heard these terms, maybe you haven't, but they're quite, quite different. So I wanna just quickly define both of them. Anticipatory design is all about trying to stay a step ahead, predicting people's needs, and maybe giving them the information 
at exactly the right time. So they don't have to go hunting for it. You're kind of delivering it on a silver platter. Whereas automated design takes it a step further. Instead of just giving people this information, it is making decisions on behalf of people without their input. That should be bolded or blinking or something. But that's the difference, that automated is happening automatically and decisions are being made on behalf of the user. Now, this topic, it is veering, I would say, on the side of a little trendy right now, but I think if you are not anticipating people's needs, then are you really doing UX? Are you really designing thoughtful products? What are you doing if you're not considering people's needs and trying to meet them where they're at, right? And I say this because we see hints of anticipatory design in a lot of experience we've probably already encountered. So if you think of um, the idea of discovery as kind of a element of a product. So e-commerce and content would be a great example of this. We all know those modules. You would like this. We saw it this morning in Gibbs talk with Netflix, the recommendations, et cetera. So we see uh, the element of discovery trying to anticipate our needs and give us more of what we want. Selfishly for them to probably sell more stuff and get eyeballs, but sometimes it works. I've bought stuff on Instagram because magically it was in front of me. Um, another way that we see anticipatory design come into play is in product experiences that are trying to help us take action. And by this I mean maybe you've had um, an event in your calendar and then on your iPhone you get a notice and it says, hey Sarah, your meeting is in 45 minutes. You should take this train or take this freeway because traffic's light, et cetera. Trying to anticipate my needs and help me take better action. And the third way that I think we see this come up right now is products that try and help us understand. My favorite example of this is Mint.com. One of my friends was the first engineer there. And um, Mint, if you're not familiar, it kind of connected all your bank accounts and then provided information about what was happening. So it wasn't just putting them all in one place. It was letting you know, hey, you spent this much on transportation or at coffee shops or buying shoes or something. And so it was helping me understand. So we see anticipatory design, I think, in a lot of products that we've already been experiencing. The challenge is when we maybe take this too far. So this brings us to an article in Fast Company a couple years ago. It was by the CEO of Huge. And in the article, he says, in the future, design is going to sweat the small stuff. And he said that life is not made easier by anticipatory design because we're still forced to make a decision. And I can definitely agree with that, and I see his point. So two examples of this would be, first of all, Amazon. We probably all bought something on Amazon. And Amazon, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it because one day I needed to, I used to live in New York for 12 years, and so I did a lot of kind of household shopping on Amazon because I didn't like carrying gigantic things of paper towel down the street and things like that. And so. I remember one day I went to Amazon and I needed laundry detergent. And I put it in thinking it would be maybe a five minute activity to quickly buy this. And then to my surprise, there's 400 options for these laundry things to wash your clothes. And yes, they're trying to anticipate my needs and they're trying to give me filters at the left, group them in certain ways, show me best sellers, show me things I've purchased before. But ultimately, I still have to make a decision, and something that should have been quite easy could quickly become quite overwhelming with all those options. Netflix, we learned so much about Netflix this morning, and I love Netflix, don't get me wrong, but what happens kind of in my head is if I've had a long day or a long week and I think to myself, I just want to open a bottle of wine and like get lost in some film and forget the rest of the world. That does not normally happen because when you pull up Netflix, you see this, you see the sea of thumbnails. And for me, it triggers this overwhelm. Again, that decision fatigue of, oh my gosh, what do I watch? And yes, they try and use all the amazing data they have to suggest, to curate, etc. 
But normally what happens is this. You go to the Netflix, you spend 25 minutes trying to find something to watch, and then two things happen. I watch the same movie I watch all the time, or I just give up. And I had a ton of response to this. This was the response I liked best. I joke with my boyfriend that his net favorite Netflix original is Infinite Scroll. So give if you want some help on Netflix, let's talk. But I think it's a great example of how we are plagued with decision fatigue, right? Even in just two basic examples that happen to us probably on a weekly basis. You've probably heard that statistic where 35,000 decisions are coming at us every day. And I read this study from 2019 from the Global Web Index telling us that three hours and 18 minutes we are spending on our mobile devices. It goes on to say that we're spending two hours and 22 minutes on social per day. Now, I was curious, the survey didn't go on to do any more math in this uh, study, so I took it upon myself to try and um, extrapolate this over the course of our entire lifetime. So, let's see if we can get back on track here. Click again. Yes, eight years. So, eight years is the amount of screen time. Now, the math was a little rough. I took off maybe five years for early childhood and late life, but I did the math about five times and I kept coming up with eight years. So, what can save us from this decision fatigue? We have to go back to the article. Because in the article, this is where we start to kind of go down that path of starting to automate decisions for people. So he said, decisions are not made and executed on behalf of the user, and that in the future, the goal is to not help the user make a decision, but to create an ecosystem where the decision is never made because it's happening automatically without the user input. And that's the difference between anticipating people's needs and automating decisions. And I think automation is great. Honestly, half of my business would not function without all the zaps I have uh, built out. But just in everyday life, we see Nest as an example. You're probably familiar with the smart thermostat. I now have something similar in my apartment, and it's great. It's good for the environment. It's good for my bank account. When I'm not home, it's automatically adjusting, it learns my habits, et cetera. It's making decisions on my behalf. Another example would be something called Digit. So this is a financial product. I learned about it maybe eight years ago from a friend of mine who works in finance. And everyone has the goal of saving money, right? You've probably said, oh, I should save more money. The reason that you don't save money is because it takes so much effort to set up those automatic transfers. Your bank can do it automatically or you have to manually go in and shift the money from one account to another. Digit did it automatically. So you would hook up your bank information to this product and then instead of just automatically saving $40 a month or something, every day or two they would save a little bit of money. So you never noticed it, but it was also doing it in a very intelligent way because it was monitoring your spending habits, and predicting how much you could afford to save. Because maybe you would think to yourself, I can save $40 a month. But if you're honest with yourself, you'll probably save a lot more. But this took that decision making out of it. And it was shocking how much money was saved at the end of the month because I didn't have to make the decision and it was automatically happening for me. So all of these are great decision or great examples of automation. But I fear that we could take it a little too far and that there are real consequences if we go down that path. So I want to leave us with three cautions and three design principles that we could maybe apply to what we're working on because chances are you'll probably have the opportunity or the may maybe the temptation to automate decisions on people's behalf. So the first caution I have for us is around the idea of accuracy. And the question really is, what happens when anticipation or automation fails? Because it's not the end of the world if that savings product 
misses a few days or saves too much one day or breaks or something. It's not the end of the world if the thermostat messes up. But there are cases where the consequences are a little bit higher. So if you think of aviation, my grandfather worked in aviation for a long time, so I know a little bit about it. But one thing that really surprised me was that pilots on average are flying the plane for three minutes, thanks to autopilot. The challenge is that, similar to if you don't work out for a while, your muscles get weak and you don't remember how to do the moves, same thing with flying a plane. Sorry if you have to fly tomorrow, but there is this concept called de-skilling. And de-skilling is just that, where you end up not being able to perform the things you were supposed to perform. And the American Federal Aviation uh, Administration has backed this up, and they said pilot error was involved in two-thirds of all the crashes from the decade of 2000 to 2010. And one example of this would be Air France Flight 447, I forget the year, but it was within the past decade, and it was traveling from Brazil to Paris. What happened was, it was bad weather in Brazil. They're flying along, and there were all these storms. And all we need to know is that there are these very important things called airspeed monitors. They got covered up in ice, and that caused the autopilot to shut off. And of course, in the cockpit, the pilots were confused, they weren't sure what to do, and unfortunately, they did the opposite of what they should have done. They jerked the nose of the plane up really fast, and that caused it to stall, and they were never able to regain control, and then it just dropped at 10,000 feet a minute. And of course, the result was not good. Everyone on that flight ended up perishing. But in the investigation that the French did concerning this crash, they said the loss of coordination in managing the surprise of the autopilot disconnect led quickly to the loss of cognitive control of the situation and the loss of physical control of the airplane. In other words, de-skilling. So we have to think to ourselves, if automation fails, can the user easily step in and course correct? And if not, what are the consequences? And what could we do to make sure that it is easier for them to course correct? It might not be as extreme as this, but I think it's something we need to consider. The next caution I have is the idea of innovation. If automation starts to take over, where are new ideas going to come from? And who is going to play the role of an observer? Toyota spent a lot of time and money bringing robots into their factories, and it definitely improved production. However, they decided to bring people back into the production line. One of the challenges was robots can do things over and over and over and very accurate, but they can't have those little light bulb moments and think, what if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? They can't be that kind of sideline observer thinking about opportunities for improvement. And so they brought people back into the factories, and they were able to see large improvements into production, but also, just from a logistical standpoint, turns out that if you're making, I don't know cars very well, but car X, um, and then you need to switch and start making car Y, it takes a lot of time to move the robots and to reprogram them, whereas with humans, it can happen much faster. So concerning innovation, we have to consider machines can do things over and over and over. But maybe we need to insert people into the process a little bit more because people can do things over and better and be that set of eyes that are looking for improvements. The third caution I have for us is around looping back to kind of our fulfillment topic at the beginning. What's going to become of the human experience if everything is getting automated more and more? Because now we know that we find satisfaction in the struggle, even if it's some mundane task at work. Once you finish it, you feel like a champion. So if we find satisfaction in this struggle, then what's going to happen to our sense of fulfillment? 
And what are we are going to do with all the free time that we might have, especially now that we know from that career builder study that we're not good at structuring and utilizing our free time, or at least a lot of us aren't. And if we don't have that work structure for flow, what's going to happen to our fulfillment? So will anticipatory design and automation rob us of this fulfillment that we need as humans? So now I want to leave us with three quick design principles to consider so that, as I said, if you're tempted to go down this path of automating decisions more and more and more, what can we do to make it a little bit more effective and minimize some of these risks? So the first one is the idea of transparency. And this is important because if we're going to make decisions on behalf of people, then we need to also make it very easy for them to take back that control and sometimes maybe course correct. So in that financial example, it was very helpful for me as a user to be able to go in and see the exact amounts, Monday it saved $2, Wednesday it saved $3.50, et cetera. That was really crucial. Without that, it would have just been a total blind situation. But further, it's very important that it's easy for me to then maybe pause that savings. If I knew I had a big expense coming up, the system wouldn't know that, but I would if maybe I had a vacation coming up or something. So we need to make sure that we are being transparent with the decisions we're making and allowing people to easily take back that control. The second principle is the idea of curation. And we heard about this this morning as well. The idea of recommendations, people who like this also like that. That's great, and that has served us well for a long time. But I wonder, in the same way as people have banner blindness, if maybe they're encountering a little bit of recommendation blindness. If we were to do usability tests, I haven't done these tests yet, but I'd be very curious. Would people trust that, or do they feel like it is just computer-generated method for the company to make more money, basically? So we need to curate in order to minimize decision fatigue, but can we do it in a more human way and give that context? So since we're all now so familiar with Netflix, instead of just saying, you watched this, you should watch that. It would be great if it could also say, you watch this, you should watch that, because this other show also is a political drama based in Washington, D.C., and the creator also created this other series you like. So giving a little bit more of an explanation around why. The third principle is that principle of trust, because if we're going to make decisions on behalf of people, then we need to have more accurate information about them. And as people are holding their personal data so much closer these days, we need to make sure that we are earning their trust so that we get better information from them. So whenever I'm designing anything, onboarding's a great example. I always keep in mind this has to be a system of give and take. Whatever information I request, can I let them know how I will use it? I love that example this morning from Netflix. I forget the exact copy, but it said, rate more movies will give you better suggestions, or something like that. Explaining the why, not just saying, go rate these seven movies. So how can you apply these principles of transparency and curation and trust to whatever you are working on, especially knowing that this temptation will come for you and your team as you have more information uh, to be able to potentially automate these decisions. But I challenge you to think to yourself, are we doing this because it is necessary for the user? Or is it almost a little bit of a novelty? Is it almost technology for the sake of technology? Earlier this year, I was um, speaking at a conference in London, and a driver picked me up at the airport. And he said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm speaking at a conference about technology. And he said, if I was prime minister, I would ban all technology. And I said, oh, interesting. <laughs> Why is that? And he said, well, technology ruins people. And he went on to talk about the impact of technology and automation and his experience with his family. His daughter is actually a pilot who flies these planes. And he talked about de-skilling and the fact that she uses simulators to keep up her skills and all that. And it was fascinating, a little creepy too, as though he had seen my talk or something. 
But when we parted ways at my destination, we kind of had this uh, closing thought that I wanted to share with you. And he said, you know, as someone who works in technology, you have a responsibility to solve problems, but you also have a responsibility not to be creating bigger problems for the people, for your product, and not just maybe the immediate, but what's the impact to their lives as well. So thank you for your time, and I'll see you later.